Uh, today, Jen will be teaching about maps. Um, as you know, like most, most of you, or some of you at least, are doing a PhD program, and our PhD students get to now uh, do what's called a teaching mentorship. Um, and in teaching mentorships, they're not supposed to just be TAs, but also be actively involved in the teaching. And so you will see each of our uh, teaching mentees uh, here teaching um, lectures. And so today, Jen will be doing uh, talking about maps. Um, first, like giving a little bit of background, talking about some data structures. Then the three maps, and then finally, how can we use a map API like Google Maps, um, like for full-on GIS systems? Um, any administrative questions before I hand over to Jen? Great. So, uh, Jen, please take it away. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Hey. So, uh, just a forewarning: I'm not an expert in maps. Um, I'm gonna do my best, but. If there's any other questions that people have that I can answer, and I'll look them up afterwards. So. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, today we're going to talk about maps. This is a technical lecture. Um, and I'm going to try to hit on things that are important for your homework. Um, there's some parts that are, frankly, a little boring because um, we're talking about geospatial data formats um, in GeoJSON and TurboJSON formats. Um, but you bear with me. And I'll try to highlight the important parts so uh, you get enough knowledge to do your homework. Um, so Alex might have already mentioned this, um, but maps are very overused. Uh, a lot of times we use maps where we could communicate um, a little more accurately or a little better if we're trying to communicate uh, with a different kind of format. Um, but that being said, there are situations where maps are really useful and they're really important. Um, and that's Generally, and obviously, um, when spatial location is important or when we want to compare different regions. Uh, so, we're going to go over two approaches today. Uh, we have our data maps. Um, for those of you that have looked over some of the New York Times visualizations, I know we've looked at a couple, we will look at a couple um, that involve maps or 538. Uh, a lot of the examples that we have are from those. Um, they do really good work, and a lot of them are interactive. Uh, which is an added bonus there. Um, data maps, at least uh, for what we are concerned with, data maps are usually built in this class with D3. Um, and the most important parts um, of why we use a data map is we want to communicate some value. Um, we want to make comparisons between different regions or locations. Um, or we want to highlight trends. Uh, and then we have street maps, which is our Google Maps, anything that you might have apps like Uber or something that uses a street view um, to an overview. And that's generally, um, we can still plot D3 uh, over top of the Google street maps, and we're going to look at Google Maps API example to do that. Um, but mainly, we have less control because we are delegating all of the, most of the renderings and the scaling and the projections to uh, the Google Maps API or the OpenStreet API. Um, so we're going to look at both of them. We're going to start with data maps, probably go into a little more detail just because we use them more. Um, so up front, uh, using data maps or just D3 requires a little more work because we are in charge of the scale of the projections. We're going to talk about that more a little bit later. Um, but to give you an actual example of what I'm talking about, uh, we have, I'll just go through a couple of these. So this is an example from 538. And these would be uh, an example of small multiples um, showing a trend, or we can make comparisons between these uh, through time as the flu spread, kind of get a general idea. And this would be an example of a core plus app. Another fun one that I had added recently. Um, so the average American lives 18 miles from their mom. Uh, so this is another core plus map. And you can it's you start to intuitively make these comparisons between the different regions. You can start to see 
internet in many different regions. It looks like where we're living, we live on average farther away than any other region. Alaska Mountains, far as the research as far as, which is not a new example, but it's still a good example. Um, so we have a divergent color scale here, and we're able to compare um, any trends in whether there are more grocery stores in a given area or less. And we can start to we get an overall view of a given country, just the US. We can start to see where there's different trends, um, and then we can make comparisons between different countries. So as you can see, France is a little more leaning towards bars. Uh, Germany is a little more um, towards grocery stores. You get the general idea. So this is the part where it gets a little technical and a little slower. This is important, I promise. Um, for those of you that have started homework four, is it, can I get a show of hands if you haven't started? Okay, so when you open your homework four, you're going to see a couple things. Uh, in D3, we use a GeoJSON format. Um, and it's basically um, a collection of objects that are described in latitude and longitude. So, we get this information. Um, we have the objects are in varying complexity from points, which is just a single position, to multi point, obviously, gets more complicated, to a line string, um, to polygons, and then we're going to be using features. This is weird. Um, so, our GeoJSON file has features. These are basically polygons um, with associated properties. So we'll get an array of features. Each feature will have the geospatial information and added properties like the name, um, maybe population, if we're adding that to our data. Um, but you probably noticed, for those of you that have already started your homework, that we have TopoJSON that we need to convert to um, so TopoJSON is an extension from what I read in GeoJSON, but um, it eliminates the redundancy. So if you think about a map of the US um, in GeoJSON, you have 50 states, and every time you have a border between two states, you're drawing that border twice. So we have TopoJSON, um, which is a very similar data structure format. Um, if you look at the Topo JSON from the homework, you'll see a geometry collection, similar to a feature collection. Um, but we'll have arcs. So let's see if we can go down here. Take a look at what we have in our Topo JSON. So yeah, we'll have geometries, um, which are similar to the features. We have associated properties, and we have arcs. And basically, the way it's structured, um, our geometry is defined by these arcs instead of separate um, polygons, like an array of separate polygon structures. So then we can convert our TopoJSON to GeoJSON and eliminate some of the redundancy, if that makes sense. So to do that, um, we, we provided a script for it. Yes. What is an arc? An arc. So actually, I have a little example because earlier today I was like, what is an arc? What are we looking at here? Um, so I can show you. Basically, as far as I understand, I, I'm going to be honest, I have no idea how, I'm assuming this is reference point for the bot mom, um, but I don't know. And so, it's basically an array of, I believe it is lat long. If that answers your question. I can definitely look it up. So from what I understand, the arcs are basically as long of a continuous path as you can get, 
for a description of as long as you can just copy you can get and you can reuse arcs for like the different board stationary areas about it. Okay, so number four. We have our Topo JSON file. We want to convert it to GeoJSON. We're using this library. Um, we would call topojson.features and we want the file name, um, or our, our topojson file, and then the objects within that file that we want to convert it. So um, for, for this example, um, we want to draw your states. So we're going into um, the object array that we have in our topojson file, and we're specifying that we want the US state, which is going to be a property in that object. So if you think about homework four, we have countries, I believe, we'll be going into the objects and we're going to be specifying how we want countries. So we use TopoJSON feature to convert this TopoJSON to GeoJSON. And then we get a single object. One of the properties is an array of features. So that's why we're specifying in our data when we're going to draw it. Um, that data needs an array of things. So we specifically need to pass it to your JSON all features. Does that make sense for everyone? Okay. So if you're having trouble drawing your map, uh, this would be the first thing I check. That you're actually passing the features array to it. So the next thing we need to do, uh, we have all these lat long um, coordinates, right? Uh, for a globe. We need to convert it to screen coordinates. So we're going to use something that is essentially a scale, um, it's a projection to do that. Um, so we have a geometry, we have our coordinates, um, and we're going to, here's a little example, call a D3 projection. Um, and there's a variety of these. Uh, we're going to look at some of them. Um, for this specific example, we're using GeoAlbers USA. So we have our initial scale. We've used scales before in previous homeworks. A lot of them have been scale linear. So D3, G Alders USA. Um, and then we want to translate it to center this projection in the middle of our screen or whatever wrapper data that we have. And then we pass our D, which is a single point, not long information, and we're going to convert that. And so just to get a better idea of what that's doing, we can see it in this. So I'm taking this lat long point, I made an SVG, which is here, and I'm using that projection scale to position my little lat long point in the SVG using the projection. So we can see our original position and then the projected screen coordinates. Does that make sense? So we're going to do that a little more complicated with our polygons. Cool. Everyone following? Okay. So there's a lot of different kinds of projections. Um, and we've listed some of them here. This is always a fun thing to look at to show real looking projections that are supported by D3. So we can start to see They scale the geometry slightly differently. If you're a little unsure, we provided the projection for you. I believe it's way cool, way cool. Um, But if you're curious and you want to play around with that a little bit, you definitely can. Um, and so it's the same data. The only thing we're changing is that scale. And then. We've narrowed our choices down to like two projections. We're not exactly sure how they scale, how they scale differently. Um, there's a fun observable by Mike Fossil that you can just see. <coughs> how different is our wrinkle triple from this one? So this is hard to compare. It's a lot different. Um, there are better more optimal projections for different things. Um, I would say a really triple is pretty good for the US, 
for, for world. Um, Mercator is good for, I want to say cities. Cities to like. Small um, scale. Yeah, smaller scale things. Um, and we're using one in our example of this. So, we have our projection picked out. We want to actually draw a map. Some of this seems probably pretty familiar to you guys already. Um, we're selecting our SVG. We're taking the width and height, so we know where to translate our scale. We want to position it in the center, so we have our projection. And then we're scaling it. And this just specifies how much the zoom is. You can look at this. This is a, a scale of 700. We're drawing this. We adjust this to 900. Let's see if this gets a little bigger. So we have our projection. We've translated it. We scale it to where we want it. Um, and then we're going to make a path generator, a geopath generator. Um, so from our previous homeworks, we've used line generators. Uh, to generate these paths. Um, are any of you not familiar with that? Okay, so it's um, a function that uh, is supplied by DP3, and we are creating our path generator, and we're adding, we're specifying that for the projection we want this projection. So it's going to scale it how we want um, for our geo albers uh, at the zoom scale that we want translated to where we want it. Uh, so then, uh, notice that we've specified two different group layers here. Um, this is not as relevant to this example, but as we build from this example and the next example, it's going to make a lot more sense. Um, it makes it a little easier to manipulate the data if we keep um, the things, the elements that we're rendering in separate group layers. Um, and that just gives us a little more control on the the right word, the position, or how what is rendered on top of what. So we have our map layer. We're going to select all of our paths that are going to be drawn. And then we're passing that JSON, GeoJSON feature array. And then our D, similar to any path generator, line generator that we have, um, we're just passing a path generator to it. Okay. And it looks like this. Everything looks good so far. This is something that it's not as necessary to grab a field. Um, we have this so you can see it, but it's not mandatory for the rendering. Um, I believe we have it in our map, but okay. So we have our map drawn, but it's pretty boring because there's nothing on it. Uh, so, we have some population information and the lat long information for each of the cities that we're going to be scaling. Um, so, we're drawing markers on top. This is where the two layers come in handy. We have our map layer, and over top, we have our city layer. Um, I know you guys are probably familiar with this already, but things that are called first, so things that are rendered first are going to be drawn first, so they will be in the back. But to add more control, when we start having multiple things, um, at least for me in my own personal experience, it's easier to specify um, our order here by our groups that we've already drawn, and then we select those. So we have our map drawn. We load in our CSV data on the U.S. city populations, um, and who's not familiar with this async await? Okay, so can someone tell me why we're using await here? For those of you that aren't familiar. Right? <coughs> you talked about CSV is asynchronous, so if you didn't have that await, you would be calling the select, <coughs> and your data could be undefined still at that point. Yeah. It's still loaded. So we use a weight um, a lot when we're loading data. And in all of the examples that we have here today, and I believe in our homework, we just use a weight for loading data. And 
That's because you could be loading it locally and it could take not very much time, um, or you could be grabbing it from the database and it takes more time. So basically, what we're doing here is we're saying pause execution and we're going to wait for this data to come back. We have to specify if we're using the wait, we have to specify that the function that it's in is asynchronous. So we put async here. And this week we'll have a lecture where we talk more about analysis and that whole thing. Kind of stuff. So, for now, understand why we're doing it. Is that clear for everyone? We're pausing, we're getting this US city data, and then we're selecting our city layer, our group that's on top, and we are taking our array of data, we're creating circles, and then we're using that projection scale that we use to make our map, and we're passing the associated data long and lot property that we specified in our CSV file. And we're scaling our circle by the population. Okay. Um, this looks weird. At least it threw me off the first when I was looking through um, some of these examples that it seems a little weird that we're... Does any, can anyone explain why we're doing it this way? We have projection, we're passing the lot along, both of these properties together. But then we're only taking the first element. Yes. It looks like projection is passing two numbers, uh, but the way the attribute is set up, you need to get a specific one one at a time. Yes. First sending that what projection is going to be saying the two lines. Yes. X Y is represented as an array, and so you just have to go X Y and then. So it's at CX, you can pull X out. It takes, it takes a lot of longitude together as the framework. So we need to specify our longitude and our, our latitude. Um, but because we're specifying, we're um, manipulating CX, our attribute, we just need to take the first one. So we want the X value. So it's taking our latitude and longitude, converting it to X and Y values for us. We're just taking the first one. So that's why we're doing it like that. Okay. So it looks like this. We have our city draw, they're scaled to the population size, and things are starting to look good. So but the circles aren't scaled, right? Oh the circle isn't projected, right? Is it not? No. The circle is the sizes are comparable. So the circle is officially projected, but not the size of the circle. So you can see that in the R attribute that yeah. there is no. So you mean if you have a projection, it could lead to scale distortions, right? Depending on the projections you use or all the projections, which we don't use for the, we, we only use the projection for the position, but not the size of the circle. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're, I don't, I can't think of a situation where you would want to use projection for the size of the circle. When you want to show the effects of the, of the projection. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. We could do that in another example. <laughs> I won't live code that now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yes, note that we are not using the projection to, to scale over here. Um, if we were going to, we could use a scale, a separate scale that we could create, like a max and min, based off of our populations, which we will do in a later example. So we have our circles. Yes. Sorry. Uh, going back. So, so like uh, the d dot y and d dot d dot red are strings, so you don't have to convert that before <coughs> you put in the projection function. So the lat long are strings. Yeah. Or their numbers, like something like that. Okay. Because wow. the the population you have to parse in, but the long and red you don't have to parse in. Yeah, and I, I suppose to, to be safe, um, we could we could parse in if we weren't sure that they were. Um, that they were numbers, that they were close. But, um, but yeah, that would be, if we were suspecting that some of these would be strings. We could definitely look, and that's another thing that I like to do a lot in the console log everything. So if you wanted to look at exactly what this data looks like.
Uh, we lost the console log data. And so it looks like it is passing through the strings. So what I think is it's assuming that you're putting in numbers. But to be safe, you could do this as well. You could say parse it. So we're pretty clear on the markers. Signing extra properties to our geometry. We're going to take it a step up and we're going to do a core plus. Okay. Is everyone still following me? So, we have our map layer. We're creating a scale. So we're going to make an initial color scale. And scale quantize, I'm not sure if we have gone into all of the different kinds of scales. We have a variety of scales in D3. Uh, this one, Pulses break our scale up into like theme categories or something. Um, so our range we're just providing five hexadecimal color codes, um, and we're going to map our values for agricultural numbers um, to colors, to theme colors. Okay. Um, so we have our color scale. Um, we load our US state JSON information. Uh, we load our agricultural productivity from 2004 CSV file, and we're setting our domain once we have our state data loaded. Um, we're going to create a domain for our color scale that is a min and max, or that uses a min and max value um, for our state data. Okay, so our scale is set up for our colors. Now we're going to create a little dictionary. And this just makes it easy to, okay, so we have our state data, which are our attributes, and we have our geometry for our map, and we want to add more information to the properties of our feature collection. So we're going to go through, and this is for ease of use, you don't have to do it this way. Um, we're creating an object called a data lookup object, and we're basically creating a dictionary that we can easily look up um, the value for our state name, and our state name becomes our key. Okay, so though this isn't exactly the same as what you're doing in your homework, um, you do do something similar because you want to have more information into your country data, right? Um, so we're iterating through. So for each of our features, uh, we are assigning a value property to the properties of our feature. Um, based off of this, this data lookup object. So we're going through and we're saying, okay, the feature, um, the name that we have associated with the feature and our properties, uh, we're going to look that up as a key in our data lookup. Does that make sense to everyone? You can console it too if you want to look at it. It's like key value pairs, we have our state and our value. Um, so what would happen if one of our states Let's say Montana doesn't have any agricultural information. What are we going to do when we iterate through? We're going to get um, an undefined. We don't have a Montana key in our data lookup object. So what, what are we going to do? You can do an or and then some default value. Yeah. Um, so a way that you can do this and what I do a lot of times is I get an array of those keys, um, whether I'm iterating through an array and I'm mapping, I'm just getting, I'm just getting an array of identifiers. So I want unique identifiers that are not going to be duplicated in any of the rows. So for this example, we see um, for homework four, it would be country names. Um, but you can go through and you say, okay, so what? Array equals D3 dot keys of our data lookup. Okay, so now we just have an array of strings, right? That are our names of our states. 
So then we can go through and say, okay, so as we're iterating through each of these features, so each of these states, or for home or country. And Devin, this is what I was talking about um, in the homework channel. So we have a way of checking to see, we have an array to check and see if we actually have information for this. So we can say, okay, so let index equals So we want to check and see what the index is um, for our name for a feature. Okay, so we're looking through, we're taking the name, we want to check and see if it's in our dictionary. So we're going to get the index. Does anyone know if it's not in there, what is our index going to be? It's going to be zero. Yeah. It's going to be minus one. Um, so, we're looking through, and we want to check and see if this index that we just looked up is, gonna be, is minus one or not. So, and are those, is anyone not familiar with ternary operator? It's a good way of doing like, if this, then do that. Okay, so. It's like shorthand if, then, if, else. Okay, so we're going through. So if this index equals negative one, we want to, we want to return. If it doesn't equal negative one, then we want to assign that value in the dictionary to our value in our properties. Does that make sense? Anyone see where this would come in handy in homework four? If anyone has any other questions, we can we can go into more detail with it during our um, hours too. Yeah. Okay. So we're making sure that we're looking through. If it has a value, we're going to assign that value to it, and then we're going to select our paths. We're going to join the path. So now we have this added information that is in our properties of each feature. So then we can use it directly. So we can say, okay, so we want to set a style fill for each of the geometries or each of the each of the features, um, and we want to color it based on our color scale by that value that we have. It looks like this. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so what happens if, so we're like returning our color scale of that properties.value thing, yeah. so we might be storing null in that properties.value, right? Like, what would the color scale do if it's returned to null? So if I were going to, yeah, and that's a really good point. So you have this, you have this idea, you're like, okay, well, I have a value, but it's null. Um, you can then check here, be like, okay, so you pause on this one. So when we're drawing these paths and we're looping through, so let's say one of these properties, instead of having a value here, it's null. So we would do something similar to what we would do when we were assigning the data. And we can do this in other ways too. We can also filter. So we have, we draw all of these circles. We have a default value for the color. And okay, we want to filter a subset of them that actually have values for this. And then we want to actually apply a different color. Or we can do it right here where we're going through, we're providing fill style for each of our geometries, but we want to check and see if our d dot properties dot value. Cool. So if one of these is null. Say we just want to make it gray. So what we're saying here is that while we're returning for a style, we're checking to see, okay, 
is this value in our properties null? Okay, then just make it gray. But if it's not null, if it does have a value, then we're using that color scale and we're um, scaling that value. We're getting a color based off of our value. Does that make sense? So is this drawing one path around every state? Yes. <laughs> Um, but if we want to make this different, we also have 
other map types that we can use, such as terrain, hybrid, satellite. Um, so a default to this, and I, I've used Missoula as an example because that's where I grew up, and I wanted to add that in there. Um, so we've created our map object, we're passing our div to it, and then we're passing our options to it. Um, so this is our lot long for Missoula, and the zoom is 10. We have a little reference here, so what happens if we make zoom 20? So we're getting the cross street in the middle of downtown of Missoula. Um, so we have a reference for this that we can look at. So generally, um, when we have our Google Maps, world is one. Um, if we want to focus on the lane maps continent, we would do about five. City view would be 10, streets 15, buildings 20. What do we want? So you see the terrain of this little, these little mountains around. So we can tailor this a little bit um, just from using this to change the style of our map object. Um, if we want to give a little more tech, the next example we have. Um, basically, I went in and I created a specific style in the style wizard, and then it lets you output that styling as a JSON. So you can go through, um, you can specify points of interest, what color you want them. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the night mode, like, uh, which darkens everything and changes the styling of the roads, features, mountains, things like that. Um, so this is the basic structure. Basically, we want to map on our website. This is what we need. Does that make sense? So the map object. Um, and this is, we're just using the Google API, um, the Google Maps API. Um, but we need to create this map object. Um, like I said, we pass it the container and any options, specifications that we want. Um, when we, if we were to create custom styling, which I'll show you below, uh, we would have a styles array in our little options object. So the option is passed as an object. So yeah, specify the center, do map ID. We specified, we change it to terrain because we want to see the mountains. And we can go into that wizard in a little more detail. Actually, I have a key. So this is the actual when you go into um, the Google Maps developer little portal, um, you can create your credentials in your API, and then one of the options is to create a map style. And so that's what I mean. You can change it to retro, change the feel of it, and it automatically you can adjust how many labels you want. I guess one downside, at least for me, um, for the Google Maps is that it has a lot of, by default, a lot of additional information that you might not actually want. Um, to communicate in your visualization. So you can scale that back on the styling of the label, and we'll do that for you. And so when you're done, you can either copy or paste this JSON into the styles array, um, or you can add this into your, your little API at the end there if the API key is not long enough for you. So um, methods to remember. Uh, basically, if, if we want to add visualization on top of our map, we need to use an overlay. So that's another thing. We have our map object, and then we have an overlay object. Um, so we create an overlay view. This is like an initial constructor for our overlay object. Um, and then we have draw, which is every time um, every time we change it. So you'll notice when I show you the other example, if I have this open, um, when we move things around, it redraws things. Um, so this is like an update. If you think about like the DC update. Um, so this like constructor, we set our initial value, what we want to load. Um, this is the initial update. If we already had our map object and we're not creating one, we can get the map. Um, panes, and we can look at these because I'm, I'm consoling them in another example, but you can think of the panes as the different levels of things that you can draw on. Um, the map is one of the bottom, and we're going to be drawing on, I believe, mouse event. 
So there's an overlay pane that you can draw on, but you can't click on anything. It, it doesn't respond to any, any mass events. Um, and then there's one just above that that we can also draw on that we're going to be using, which you can actually click on on things that we've drawn there. And it, it clicks up on that for that. Um, <laughs> Auto move, at least for me, um, this is like if you have more interaction. We're not really using this. This is in the example. Um, but if we were to take it out, uh, it wouldn't actually change the visualization. This is like you're interacting with something. What do you do when you close a window? I'll move. So, and then finally, we have to set our map. I'm sorry. Um, so, I mentioned that we delegate a lot of things, including the projection, <laughs> our scaling, um, and our, our drawing of the map to Google Maps, but we still want to get that projection if we're going to draw. Um, let's say we want to draw circles for our cities, which we're going to. Um, we need to get the projection of whatever Google Maps is using so we can scale our data and draw it accordingly. These are our panes. Like I mentioned before, we're going to be drawing this overlay mouse target so we can click on them and, and see the data that's associated with the different circles. And then these are a couple important methods that we're going to go over. Um, so similar to our scale basically, um, we have our projection, which is converting our lat long information to screen pixels. Uh, and we do it this way with this method um, for the overlay objects, which is from container pixels to file on. And this is similar to our scaling. Um, you can also invert as well, but we're not doing that. So I'm going to go through it. Actually, I'm going to show you the example first so this is actually making sense, because I feel like I'm just explaining a bunch of abstract things, um, but you have no idea what I'm talking about. So, I made a little example of UFO sightings from cattle. Uh, so we have UFO sightings data. I was actually really surprised the, the size of it is like 800,000 rows. And so I spent like, it was, it was like 20 minutes trying to go through and thin some of it out, um, which I was unsuccessful. I like narrowed it down to like 300,000 or something. Um, and I was trying to get specific, like, I'm just going to select um, ones from these years. Uh, but it spans from like 1965 to like 2013. So what we're doing is we're going to take our data set, we're going to filter it because we just want the US settings because this is interesting and relevant to us, and then we're going to take a sample of 200 from them. So this is what our data looks like. Um, we have the city, country, it's a global data set, so we have different countries in here. If it is, if the country's US, then we have the state information, we have the duration of the experience uh, in minutes or in seconds. And then we have any comments of what was happening, as well as the shape of, of whatever was seen. Um, so what we're doing here is, so we create our map container. We want to just take up the entire, uh, the entire window. Um, so we're 100%, 100%. Um, we're creating a little UFO class that we're going to class our SDGs with. Um, we're going to create an SVG for each data point that we're adding uh, for a UFO sighting. And we're doing that because it makes it a little easier as far as scaling. We don't know how big um, we want our SVG. If we just drew one SVG, that would cover the entire thing and draw the circles on that. I suppose we could just make it 100%, 100%. But we didn't do it that way. We're doing a bunch of SVGs. But as a note, you don't want to create a bunch of SVGs each week. Um, for your homework, you generally create an SVG and you've added an element to that. So, that being said, moving on. Um, so, we have our little script specifying our Google API and our API key. And now we create a Google Maps. Um, we want to load uh, this. So, this is um, what I mentioned before with styles. So, this after I went into the wizard, I created in dark mode what I wanted it to look like, and then I outputted that as a JSON file. And I had added it into this option, um, and 
it took up a lot of space in the example, and it was kind of a waste of space. Um, so with Alex's recommendation, we created a separate JSON file for it. Um, so just so you know, that is the battle rate for the Google Maps API. Um, we just kind of we put it someplace else so we don't have a bunch of clutter on our on our example here. Um, it looks like it is not as important, but it specifies a lot of the actual features. So like if it's a street, do this. If it's a point of interest, do this. If it's a specific point of interest, do this. Um, so in our options, um, we're specifying the zoom level. We want the country. Um, our center point, I this was a little arbitrary. I wanted to center it on the US, so um, I think I put it somewhere in Nebraska. And uh, I wanted to specify our type ID is roadmap, and then I'm passing the styles right here. So then we're creating our Google Maps object. We're selecting our map div container, and then we're passing our options to it. And you'll notice that it has to be a node. So when why wouldn't the DT selection work here? So if we select, if we just use DT select map. I mean, there's a D3 selection object for Google Maps that's not selection. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we want to specify, if we are using a D3 selection, we want to specify that we want to know from it, not the D3 selection. Um, so then we're loading in our UFO signings. We want to filter it by country. We just want the US ones. And then we're just taking a slice of that data. We're just getting from, from zero index to um, so then, now we have to specify our overlay, right? So we have our Google Map object. We want to create an overlay view. So like I said, on app. So on overlay, um, we have our different panels. We want to use this overlay mouse target because we want to be able to click them, right? Um, so then we're appending. What we're doing is we're taking that selection. We're appending a div to it. We're clapping it UFO. And then we can style our SVGs accordingly. Uh, by specifying that all of the SVGs in our class of our div. Okay. So we're using this on remove. And then for drawing, um, we take this projection that Google Maps is using, setting our padding to 10. We're creating a circle scale, which is we're going to scale our circles by the duration of the event of the UFO sighting um, in seconds. So we're taking, we're scaling it by the minimum and the maximum. The range is going to be to seven pixels, and then we create our markers. So we're taking that US data sample, we're selecting all of our all of our SVGs, we're specifying that we want to append them to that layer, that overview that we made, um, and then we're appending our SVGs. To the SVGs, we're appending the circles. You've seen this before. Um, and we're taking uh, the styling and we're coloring well, we're coloring them green unless the shape is fireball. So this is similar, like I said earlier, okay, so you have your population of your countries. Um, what if you don't have the population? If the value is null, you do one thing. If it's not, you do another. So similar to what we've seen before. And then we're scaling it by that circle scale that we've made before for the duration. We have to transform it to center it. Um, so we're centering. And we're actually setting our map, so it's creating a map. And it looks like this. So we get an eerie glow here. So we can see we haven't had very many fireball situations, um, but the ones that we have had are on the East Coast. Um, we scale our circles um, on our overview that is drawn over our map object. And we have a nice eerie. It looks like we even have one in Hawaii. Good to know. In Alaska. And there's our map. So, does anyone have any questions about that? The easiest way, at least for me, to learn this was just to make my own, and it was actually pretty fun. Um, there's a lot of documentation on the Google API if you are interested in that. Um, so I would look through that and play around. Definitely play around with the styles because that was fun. Um, and yeah, that's, that's about it. Okay, so for the rest of the class, I think. And we'll take questions, but the rest of the class will do catch up and get, which I missed uh, doing so. Any questions?
Okay, so um, I'll first talk a little bit about the types of version controls, and then um, and then we'll do some practical Git stuff. Um, um, so why do we use version control? Maintain different version of Yes. So we, we want to use different versions of code. We want to be able to do that. Why do we care about different versions? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, we want to get to the to a space. Multiple guys go to the same page of code. And it's kind of typical to kind of hide it. Yeah. Like, version control is really helpful if you collaborate with people. Like, you've probably all been to the hell of writing a report with some of your like fellow students. And then somebody was sending around board documents, um, and you have to manually do the merges with like version two, version three, and so on. So version control does that well for us um, with with code. Other reason why we want to use version control? Well, if we break something, exactly. We can kind of like, if we break something, we can reproduce what went wrong and what point it went wrong. Other ideas? On that same note, if you release software now. Uh, many different versions and they're released at the same time, it can really help track that. Exactly. So uh, you can track releases um, and see what kind of bugs you have in certain um, things. Another good reason, especially for, like, well, a very good reason, but also if you just by yourself. Let's suppose you just by yourself um, and working on code, what does version control also enable you? It's a backup. Exactly. You have this backup because most version control systems, like it doesn't, it isn't necessarily mandated by a version control system, but most version control systems also allow you to synchronize with the server, right? So you always have like your homework. If you set it up uh, correctly on GitHub, uh, for example, and you push to it, um, then you have a backup. So if your like dog eats your laptop, uh, <laughs> you still um, you still have a backup of, of all of the Crashes homework that work that we did for this class. Um, so yeah, um, we also sometimes want to simply create alternative states, right? Like we want to try something out with, without kind of ruining everything that we have in our main branch. Um, and so, who does like still remember um, like Subversion and CVS um, as a version control system? Anybody use those? Like this is really interesting, interesting for me. <laughs> so I really used those a lot, and Git was a big step for me. But uh, back in the day, we had these uh, these centralized repositories um, for version control, where there was one server that everybody wrote to, um, and then you had all of these clients around that. So this is like a centralized model, um, and like this is really what people used up to. Basically, when Git, with some exception, there were some other distributed ones, but mostly people used the version and CVS um, back in the day. And that has like that, that's kind of like one advantage of that. It's a pretty simple model, right? Um, you have like one server, you give people permissions, and then you write to that. But this tends to get pretty complex for larger projects, especially if you're in a big organization. Like, who is allowed to write? Do you give the intern who's just like starting out developing? Um, write permission on your product, um, you might not want to. Um, especially tricky is that uh, like this is especially tricky for like um, open source software engineering, right? Like what people usually did is to send patch files around, and then people would uh, look at the patch file, and then somebody with write access um, would actually like merge in the patch. Um, and now we have distributed version control. A distributed version control is like the what what Git does. Um, and what's great about it is that like every single um, person who works on this has basically its own little version control server locally in their directory. Um, there isn't really a dedicated server anymore. So like what you're running onto your computer with Git is basically the same thing as GitHub runs. Um, the only difference here is that, that you all agree on that GitHub might be the server that you work with, but technically they are both equal. 
Um, and um, the, the, the standard model of Git allows you to essentially like um, ask people to pull from your repository, right? And so like you can really do this completely decentralized and just like have your own machine be on the internet. And instead of having some centralized server, you can just ask somebody, hey, I've made changes, just pull from my repository and then sync up. Um, so that's great. Um, it's also everything is local. So if you want to look up uh, older branches, um, if you did that with some kind of like subversion, that usually took quite a while because you had to transfer all the data um, to your local machine. Uh, but with Git, everything is local. That is a little bit more expensive in terms of storage, but we have fairly large paragraphs nowadays. Um, and then one other thing that I added, um, kind of like by making these commits easy on your local computer, um, you should really, or you can now really do this commit often model. And this is something that I would recommend that you commit regularly uh, every time you do something atomic. Like I want to fix this bug, commit, and don't do two, uh, don't do two other bugs in addition to that. Right? Like if you build one feature, commit. If you build another feature, commit. Don't do like three features and then commit because this way you can isolate uh, what happens. And you don't actually have to deal with any kind of merges at, at that point because of how it works. And so I just want to show like a brief illustration of like how basically Git works. So I would start off like a initial as a repository, okay? So let's suppose this here is me. Like I am like the person um, here, and I set up a repository, then I make a change. And I then commit this change here, okay? So I'm like not building a graph. And then I make another change. Um, and then I have like this state of my repository. Um, I could have like you now go back and say, oh, something here, I want to try out something different. Um, I'll branch off um, and have this change. But let's let's ignore this for now. Okay. Um, and now if I were to use a server, let's say this is me, and here I have a server. And now I want to synchronize, like let's draw a line here. Now I want to synchronize to that server. And now I basically say something like, push this over to the server. Um, and the server will then also get all of your stuff locally on their computer. Um, so you basically have now both of the states are, are more or less identical. Great, so now let's suppose um, I keep working. Um, and here, like I commit again, like this here is a push. In, in GitHub terminology, this here is a commit. And if I want to keep working on this, um, if I want to keep working on this, I keep committing and committing. And then if I want to synchronize this to the server, I have to push again, right? So, and then at this push, I would get this stuff here. Okay, now I suppose I have like my, my friend is also working on my code. Um, they are like cloning this repository, so they get like this state and everything back here. I'm not gonna draw that out here. And now they make a change. Um, and at the same time, I make a change. Um, and now we both want to like synchronize to the server, right? But it turns out that my friend was a little bit faster. So my friend now um, gets to write to the server. And what would happen now if I were to also try to push? Yes, I could have a conflict. So if I were to try to push, this would actually not let me. Um, I would first have to do a pull. Um, and that pull will kind of like give me, like, well, actually, what would happen is um, I would kind of like get this kind of pulling it in here, and here I would get like, an, let's say I'm not drawing this here as a line, as this kind of like local state where I have a merge conflict. And then I resolve this merge conflict, commit that again, and then I can actually push this back to the server. Okay? Well, actually, there's not a two in here. So that's the idea of like distributed version control like this. Any questions about this model? Great. So now let's look at this from like a practical perspective.
Um, and this, you can follow along again on the tutorial website um, in the lecture, uh, in the Git lecture. Um, so first, what is Git? Um, Git was created by Linus Torvalds. As you probably know, Linus Torvalds is quite a character. Um, he usually took a time out because of his abusive language on many different mailing lists. Um, <laughs> He's abusive to a lot of people, including to himself. Um, he, um, like I said, um, he, um, Git is the British English slang that is equivalent to like an unpleasant person. And he literally said, like, I name all of my software projects for myself first Linux, now Git. Um, but um, it actually, Git turns out to be super popular nowadays. Like, um, about 70 to 80 percent of searches on Google uh, regarding version control are about Git. Um, it is really true. This good is very fast. Um, we have this, everything is local. It's free. It's safe against corruptions. We'll go, not go into this uh, in the list. But and another big benefit is we have these like nice um, platforms like GitHub um, to work with, well with Git. Okay. So um, one thing that like uh, if you initialize Git, you should definitely set up your username. And by the way, like I'm going to use here the command line. I think usually like using the command line builds character. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's also like useful to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Like I personally use the command line for Git for all my stuff, but some people like desktop clients, and I'll talk a little bit about desktop clients here. But you should be like comfortable uh, using Git on the command line. So let's uh, let's like this is configuration. So you set up your name and your email address, and I really encourage you to set this up correctly, especially when you're working on a project, because like your pro like your your class project here, we might want to look at if there's like a conflict between students. We can look at the logs, right? Who did what, and if you set all of this up correctly, there is not going to be like any ambiguity of who contributed how much to your project. Um, okay, let's do a simple example. I'm creating a, a directory in my project. And then I'm changing directory into my project. And now I'm initializing uh, like this. Here is nothing, of course. So there is nothing in this, uh, repo in this directory. Uh, and now I initialize a Git, a Git repository here. And now I initialize an empty Git repository. This is like really like now we have our full on version control um, in this particular directory. Um, so what does Git do? If we now look at um, in this directory, you see this one hidden folder, the .git folder. And the .git folder con contains all of the meta information we need about this repository, but also all the previous versions. So like you basically, this contains all the history um, that of, of stuff that you ever created. Um, and the one interesting file to look at in here is the um, config file. So here, if we, um, if we cat, just prints the content of the file, um, this is kind of like, what is the configuration of my file? And this, of course, is very simple because I've just initialized it. So there isn't really anything in here that's just like um, my, this is my core repository. Um, here is an, a, like a more interesting example um, that would, for example, um, be the class website from 2016. Um, if I've set this up with GitHub, um, here's where you can see these different, how different branches are managed and how different servers are managed. So a remote branch here, or our remote repository is the GitHub repository, and then I have a master branch here. Okay, now in our simple my project, let's create a world. Echo simply just um, I'll put something in the, the greater than sign here, just writes this over the file. Uh, and now you can if you look demo.txt txt contains my hello world example. Now I can add it to version control. Okay, and now if we click, like if you run git status, we can see that we are on branch master. There are no commits yet, but there are some changes to be committed. Uh, we have a new file of demo uh, it's called demo.txt. Uh, now we can commit the file. Okay, uh, that works just fine. Uh, this is now uh, under version control. So um, we can check whether that worked by running git status and says on branch master, nothing to commit, working to be clear. Great. So that means our file now is checked and properly committed um, to Git, but it's still, of course, only stored on our local computer here. Now let's suppose we want to change this file. 
Are you still spinning? And here I'm using a double, uh, double greater than that basically means over uh, uh, append and don't overwrite. Um, and if I look at this, we'll see that this has probably appeared in here. Um, and if we now ask it about its status, we'll see that there is a modified file. Right? So this isn't really like the change that I just made isn't isn't tracked yet. Um, and so like what we if we just did what we earlier did, I can come run git commit minus m uh, add a line. Um, always use meaningful commit messages because this is really where uh, you can later like if you find a bug. This is what you what you use as the first line to find that. So is this going to work? Some people are shaking their heads. It is not. Um, it's uh, it turns out that you have um, you can't just commit. You have to tell Git explicitly every single time which files you want to commit. Um, so what you would have to do is to either on git add this particular file, or you can add, you can do like a shortcut of that by simply adding a minus a. Uh, the minus a means um, add all of the files uh, that are already tracked and only have had changes. So if you have a new file, this is not going to commit it, and this is usually a very common like a problem or like, a common mistake that you kind of like create a new file and then you forget to commit it and then forgot to commit files, whatever is the next commit thing. Um, well. okay. The order of the, the message needs to follow. Okay. Um, now I've successfully committed this change. Um, okay, now we can look at what happened so far in our Git uh, history. Um, and by running git log. And so we see that I first had this, uh, that this commit here. And these are this, these unique IDs of the commits um, that you can always reference. Um, and then I did my second commit um, here. And this is also like the, the current head on the master branch. And the current head is always like, um, where am I in my uh, repository? OK, um, now we want to work with branches. If I, I'm like, this is now creating a, a different like version of uh, what we have. So I'm creating a draft branch because I want to modify uh, my, my, my code here. Um, and if I now get this git branch, it will tell me there's these two branches, draft and master, and the one that you're currently on is going to be shown with a star. Um, so this is the active branch. And so if we now wanted to modify, uh, the uh, draft branch, we would have to uh, git check out and uh, draft. Okay, and now we switch to branch draft. Uh, we can see that the demo.txt looks exactly the same, but now let's edit it. Okay, um, so this is containing demo.txt, and now we commit this again. Great. Um, if we now like check out master, we'll see um, that this isn't in the file. Okay, so clearly we have like changed that file, but only in one branch, um, and in master we still have the original thing. So the text we added isn't there. Um, and now let's do something uh, in our uh, demo, like in our master branch. Let's say I'm um, writing a, I'm just running open, or I just like add. Okay, I added that to demo.txt, and it's in there. Um, and now I, I commit. Okay, now both versions are committed, but now we have conflicting versions, right? Um, so this can now 
be a little bit problematic. If I run git merge draft now, like this is the command that I would take to reintegrate my draft branch into my master branch, and this will result in a conflict. So I get this merge conflict in demo.txt, um, and I can now look at demo.txt um, in like uh, any browser like, and here we have like a nice uh, interface. Um, we basically want actually both, um, so we can just edit this locally. So this is what we want. We just want this um, to be the content. Great. So now we have uh, kind of like a result this conflict. So demo.txt has like all the stuff that we want. Um, and now we could simply um, commit this resolve conflict. Um, and, uh, and then like basically now we have like a proper version that contains all of this stuff in here. So everything here is back in order. Uh, and if we look at git status, we have on branch master, nothing to commit working directly clean. OK, um, one thing that you will notice if you have looked carefully at your homeworks that we published is that we always give you all the git ignore file. And so it turns out that you do not want to version control all files. Right? There's reasons, for example, you do not want to version control very big media files. There's other technology to integrate those. But there's also usually lots of stuff um, that your IDE or whatever your build process is creating, and you do not want to commit. Um, and so you kind of specify which of the files you do not want to commit um, in a .git ignore file. Um, so here's an example for like a Jackal website. So in, in, in Jackal, um, the, the output of a compilation process is stored in this .site folder. So we say like never ever uh, commit this .site stuff. Never do this like CSS cache here. Never do this .jackal metadata. Never put in like save idea files. Never uh, save gem files. Um, another file that's commonly is like a max at least a DS store file that has um, uh, folder properties that is often um, incorrectly committed. So here you can specify, you can add just a .git ignore file uh, with which file you want to ignore. Um, and there's like lots of different uh, templates for different kinds of projects. OK, great. Um, I see we're like, um, basically out of time, but um, I I think that you guys probably know how to use GitHub by now. I just wanted to point out this little section here. So please do read through this, because this is like a nice way of setting up your homework um, like, uh, and like having a local copy on Git and still getting stuff from us. I'm not going to go through this, but here you're basically working with two different remotes, one where you pull our changes from and when, one where you push your changes to. Um, that's a fairly easy setup if you follow those steps. This is going to make your whole homework process a little bit easier. OK, great. On Thursday, uh, we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about, I forgot, but I'll figure it out on Thursday. <laughs> um, and see you then.